questions. That time. Thank you. Public Library District Board of Trustees meeting to order Thank you. for Tuesday, February 18th at 7.32. All the notices have gone up. And right now, Trustee Barshi, can you do the roll call? And then after you do the roll call, we will bring in Trustee Johnson. Okay. <coughs> so I won't call his name? Roll right? call. No, because okay. we have to... Okay. For the bylaws, you have to agree to. Okay. Uh, Trustee Barshers, uh, here. Trustee Fishman, here. Trustee um, Rogers, here. Trustee Wolf, here. Trustee McDonald, here. And right now we have Trustee Johnson on the phone. And Trustee Johnson. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we need to agree to allow you to sit in on the meeting. Can you talk a little bit about? Uh, what kept you from being at the meeting? The General Assembly is in session, and I am calling you from our beautiful state capital of Springfield, Illinois. Okay. Can we have a motion? I move to accept Trustee Johns Johnson on the line. Of oh, attendance? Okay. Of attendance, yes. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay. Uh, there are, is no public present. We have from the League of Women Voters one of the uh, observers, and on behalf of the Board of Trustees, we would like to congratulate the League for 100 years <laughs> yep. on their 100 year celebration and for keeping the public informed of what the issues are as well as encouraging the vote. Okay, right now behind number one, there's a review of the draft of the January 21st regular board meeting minutes. A motion to approve those minutes. Second. Okay. It's been moved by Trustee Wolf and seconded by Trustee Fishman to approve the minutes from the January 21st, 2020 board meeting at 7.30 p.m. Is there any discussion or comments? Okay. Have been none, we move forward to approve the minutes, Trustee. Okay. We need a vote, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Trustee Barshus, yes. Mm -hmm. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Johnson. Trustee. Yes. <laughs> Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. Trustee McDonald. Aye. Just to note that minute approval of minutes does not require we know, a roll. But we do it anyway. <laughs> okay. Just Thank for the fun of it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then behind is, uh, are the minutes from the uh, parliamentary procedure workshop mm -hmm. that was before the last meeting, and they are behind tab number two. Is there, there is one correction that needs to be made. Okay. It did not start concurrently with the regular meeting. It started at 6.30 or 6, however you want to record that. Mm. But it definitely was not going on at the same time as the meeting, the regular meeting. So we just need to amend the starting time. Um, on the minutes, it reflects that uh, the meeting was called to order at 623. Is there somebody else? And but under the, the, under the heading of what the meeting was, uh, it reads 730. Mm -hmm. No. It says 6, 6, 6 p.m. You're looking at the first one. There's another copy of the minutes for the parliamentary procedure. There are two sets of minutes. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Behind tab two? Behind tab two. Well, I don't have a copy that reads 
here, I got the same thing. Right here. Okay. So 6 p.m. And then it said it called order at 6 p.m. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So it was moved by, I believe, Trustee Fish. Oh, we didn't have it. No, no, we I'll motion we approve it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's Who been moved to approve? I did, Stuart. Trustee Wolf. Trustee Wolf has moved it, moved to approve the minutes from the uh, January 21st, 6 o'clock, uh, 6 o'clock meeting in the boardroom. Trustee Fishman has seconded it. Is there any discussion? More discussion? It's been moved and approved by Trustee Wolf and with seconding by Trustee Fishman. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you. Now, we are honored to have Stephen Coble, Digital Services Manager, to provide an overview of his department. So, have at it. Hi, everybody. I know pretty much everybody here, so I'm going to introduce myself for the people viewing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Stephen Coble. I'm the Digital Services Manager here at the library, and this is my 10th year at the library. Um, and it's been quite a journey to digital services. Um, digital services is a department in libraries that kind of is emerging as a core library service. But it's been a journey for us to uh, get here. Um, in 2010, I was hired here at the library to work in adult services. I'm a degree librarian. I have a background in reader's advisory, all of the typical librarian duties. Um, I was hired as the teen librarian and a technology librarian. This was in 2010. iPhone had just been out for two years. iPad just came out. Um, so it was my role as trainer to acclimate not only our staff to a digital environment, but also our patron base as well. Um, and I spent quite a few years doing that. Um, it was around that time as well that the library's participation in our ebook lending consortia kind of came into existence and since then has kind of exploded. Um, in 2013, uh, the director at the time, Ellen Clark, changed my title, took away my teen librarian responsibilities, and those were given to somebody else so I could focus more of my time on the growing responsibilities of what would ultimately become digital services at that time. Um, and in 2017, the director, Heather uh, McCammon Watts, um, did some restructuring and uh, created digital services as a you know, full-blown department um, managing all of our electronic collections and resources. Um, I oversee all of the patron and staff education in our technology classes and things of that nature. Um, I manage all of our websites, online presences. Um, we do a lot of stuff. I oversee the staff that assists patrons in the computer room um, with not only the computers that are in there, but our various pieces of equipment, scanners, that type of stuff. And, you know, we help patrons with their devices as well. That has become so ubiquitous mm -hmm. in the past few years. And that's kind of, you know, personally how I feel that digital services has become a core library service. We've got, um, you know, a digital landscape that we live in now. Um, patrons have an expectation to borrow ebooks to retrieve accurate, authoritative content um, from our library. And it is my role to manage those resources, manage those um, staff members, manage that time as well. Um, yeah. um, as far as the state of digital services at the library is concerned, uh, we've never seen more usage before. Um, looking at ebook and digital media lending alone, um, we have increased leaps and bounds. Um, just looking, I pulled a couple of statistics. I'm not a numbers guy, but I like, like to look at them sometimes. And if we look at our um, ebook circulation statistics from fiscal year 14-15, we've got about 38K. Yeah, pretty good. You know, our district's about 25,000 people. It's pretty good. Um, looking at 1920, which we're about eh, halfway through, 
we've got 2020. 70, uh, uh, library, library year 2019, 2020. 2019, 2020. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I yeah. thought you were saying yeah. 1920. No, yeah, yeah. No, no. no, fiscal year 1920, 19. just about to end, yeah. June 30th. Yeah. We've got, for that same ebook product, about 74,000 circulations. Oh. And we've got wow. months to go before the fiscal year is oh. out. Oh. So <laughs> our collections are well used and well loved. And I think that's a testament to. Um, the expertise our staff members provide in public service, we tell people about the products, we show them how to use the products, mm -hmm. and then subsequently they tell their friends, they come see us, and we've created a domino effect. Um, where not only are we providing an excellent library service to patrons, we're also sneaking in technology literacy education to them and helping keep them on the forefront of technology. Mm -hmm. um, we are like so fortunate here at Wilmette to have um, a great electronic resources budget. We have a really apt staff and um, really inquisitive patrons. So I think we are situated to see as we move forward digital services to become um, you know, a contender, a staying power here at the library. Um, so that's kind of my story um, in addition to um, all of those things I mentioned earlier. I also sit on various committees at the library, in our library system. Uh, I attend conferences and all of the typical um, librarian duties as well. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? What's your favorite part of all of that? <laughs> do you have one? I have to tell you, <laughs> so I inherited the computer room staff members in 2017. And that, uh, managing them has probably been the most rewarding part mm -hmm. of being digital services manager. Um, taking the opportunity to identify talent and then foster that talent, and that has, for me, been mm -hmm. really rewarding to see those staff members excel and succeed. Um, I also love buying eBooks. Um, I like to run a report weekly mm -hmm. to see what the holds look like and then we purchase to meet that demand. Um, so that's a fun list to look at because it's a really good snapshot of what's hot right now. So that's mm -hmm. fun. Do you think that they, since they've improved Libby as well as the way to get mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. that's contributed a lot to the retrieving because it's a lot simpler now than it used to be? Absolutely. Um, and that's a really important part of digital services is user experience. And as we've progressed, I can't believe I've been here for 10 years, um, the user experience of our online products, of our ebook platforms, has increased leaps and bounds. Um, it's never been easier to use. It's been more accessible than it's ever been, especially for people who might be on the other side of the digital divide. So, you know, I think about people like my parents um, who, I mean, are savvy people but sometimes need a little bit of a push and this is something that they could pick up and play with pretty easily so the user experience absolutely has driven usage for sure and Stephen to that point I attended one of your weekly monthly ebook seminars mm -hmm. and yeah. there was an array of ages right. I felt an array of uh, confidence absolutely but with your presentation and your hands-on and um, it became for me very user-friendly and um, just I sometimes think it's so easy to go online and reserve or just yep. check out books that sometimes it I say, well, I don't even need to step into the library. Good news, bad news. But I mean, I'm here a lot. But Absolutely. It, it makes it very convenient for people. A hundred percent. I helped a patron on the phone on Friday who's in London. And she's like, I'm going to be in London until March. How do I use my library card? And we went over it together over the phone. And she walked away from that, you know, excited. And that's kind of my approach is that I always tell patrons at every interaction that we want you to get the content. Right. So what can we do to help you acquire the content? What training do you need? What questions can we answer? That type of stuff. And, and just one Try other thing. Try to assuage their fears as well. well mm -hmm. After mm -hmm. I felt like I was trained and able to go out into the world, almost it was totally word of mouth. Everybody I could tell about it, not only being a trustee, but feeling 
you know, so good about our services, but how I could share that with people, and whether it's um, an ebook or a magazine or right. um, a canopy and movies and videos and so forth. So it, it seems to be a great um, conversation. Do you know about this? You know, and, and a lot of people don't, but I hope have pursued it. You've got a good stack of resources. Of, Absolutely. And the programs that you s And provide. it's a really exciting time to be like in digital services and libraries. I mean, mm -hmm. there, our mm -hmm. landscape will be changing as uh, technology progresses and, you know, as demand progresses too. We're constantly evaluating our resources, evaluating the models that we're in, and seeing how we can make the most efficient use of our budgetary dollars mm -hmm. for that content that the patrons want to devour. Are there any challenges you foresee on um, the horizon? You know, I think there are quite a few models that vendors have that are not sustainable. And so we will ultimately, I believe, look at more sustainable models that are price fixed, cheaper, um, but still delivering the content, um, but less costly. So that will be, I think, is a, in a period of reevaluation for many libraries across mm -hmm. the country, not just us. Um, so while we're celebrating our victories and such high usage and, you know, patron technology literacy and all that fantastic stuff, we're also looking to the future and kind of weighing our options and seeing what will um, work for us as we move forward. That's great. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank Enjoy your meeting. Thank you. Great. 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 Thank you. Okay. Behind that door number. <laughs> okay. Are we ready for the treasurer's report, Trustee Rogers? Yes. Thank you. Um, January is not a major month for revenue uh, coming in. Um, we've been reminded of that, of course, with the tax bills that are due in early March. Um, we will, of course, receive a great deal more money in March than we will see in January or February. Um, we got $15,000 in general fund interest, 8600 in replacement taxes, and 5200 in miscellaneous income in January. You'll notice that tax receipts or property tax is not even in that list, or at least it's far enough down that it was less than $5,000. Um, we are at 56% uh, in expenditures, and the seven-month rate would be 58%, so we're right where we plan to be. Uh, no extraordinary expenses. We spent 50000 almost 51000 in insurance, uh, employee insurance, the Wellness Insurance Network. Uh, 23000 with com CCS, computer, Cooperative Computer Services, and the rest uh, major expenses were for materials. Um, the, uh, uh, there's really nothing else extraordinary. If you have any questions, uh, I can certainly uh, try to respond to those. Um, if there are none, um, I think we're ready to I move approval of the bills and salaries for January, which you have as the next tab in your materials. I'll second that. Trustee Rogers has moved to approve the uh, bills and salaries for uh, January 2020, and Trustee Wolf has seconded. Any discussion or questions? Okay. Being none, can we have a vote on approving the January 2020 bills and salaries mm -hmm. expenditures? Trustee Garcius? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Uh, Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Aye. Trustee McDonald. Aye. Okay. Action items. 
it on. Trusty. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is a discussion yeah. item. And um, these are two chapters from Serving Our Public 4.0, Standards for Illinois Public Libraries. And what I would like to do is review this content with you this evening. So you can follow along on tab five. Um, the genesis of this conversation stems from the fact that our agenda is a little light this month. And as such, I decided, well, let me check and see what, um, what our requirements are for the per capita grant application later this year and see if there's some homework that we can accomplish in fulfillment of that duty. So I reached out to um, the state library and the representatives there um, informed me that there is going to be a public announcement very shortly about what those requirements are, but I have in good confidence that um, the, the um, uh, the requirements are going to be changing this year. Um, after many years, um, the per capita grant application had a certain formula. And part of that formula was that each year we would review a single chapter of serving our public. And then there were some other measures that we needed to complete and report upon. Um, what I've learned and what I think we're going to hear very shortly is that um, the review of the standards is going to be the requirement for the per capita grant uh, application annually. Mm -hmm. So not just a single chapter, but the entire book. Um, and this January saw the publication of Serving Our Public Four, and that's this publication that's set forth by the Illinois Library Association. So this is a brand new publication that we have here, and the first two chapters of which um, appear behind tab five. Uh, there are 13 chapters in, um, uh, in the book, and so by doing chapters one and two here at our February meeting, if we do one chapter a month for the balance of our year, uh, we'll, we'll be able to fulfill our requirements um, if we stay on pace with that. Okay. So that's what I would like to do. And so we can start at the top um, with the first chapter, which is a review of our core standards. Now, Many of you are aware that Wilmette Library um, is a five-star library in terms of our statistics. I'm going to trot that out a couple times this year if I can. Um, and that means that in many regards, we are meeting and exceeding the standards. There is a line in here that I think is important for us to, to reflect upon. Now, just because um, we have a certain degree of excellence here, that doesn't mean that that's where it stops. Excellence is a moving target. We believe in continuous improvement, and so the this, this sentence reads, the staff and boards of libraries that meet basic standards may pose the query, what makes a library effective? And consider ways of enhancing the library's effectiveness in serving the community. So I think that's kind of where I would like to pose the, uh, the context of our review of these chapters. It is true that we're gonna go through all of these and we're gonna find that we do fulfill those standards. Um, my question to you all is, how can we um, continue to enhance the effectiveness of the resources that we're providing? So on the first page, in the introduction, it says that in order to meet these standards, we need to, one, operate in compliance with Illinois library law, have an organized collection of information, have written <coughs> library policies approved by the library's governing body, have a fixed location and provide regular hours of services, have a trained paid staff to manage the collection and provide access to it, be supported in part or, or in whole by public funds, and have an identifiable library materials budget. Well, we clearly meet all of those basic standards. Moving on to page two, the 23 core standards are outlined. If you'll humor me, I'd like to go through all of these with you. We'll, I'll, I'll do this briefly, but I think it's it, it bears um, it bears mention. <laughs> Core one, the library provides uniformly gracious, friendly, timely, and reliable service to all users. Check. The library is established and operates in compliance with Chapter 75 of the Illinois Compiled Statutes. We reference it frequently. The library is governed by a board of trustees elected or appointed and constituted in compliance with the relevant sections of Chapter 75 of the Illinois Compiled Statutes. You all are present. The library compiles uh, or complies with all other state and federal laws that affect library operations. And there's an appendix that provides reference to that. And we are in compliance. Core five, the library adopts and adheres to the principles set forth in the American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights and other ALA intellectual freedom statements and interpretations. 
we do, and we have appended those into our policies. Core six, the library adopts and adheres to the Code of Ethics of the American Library Association. The library adopts and adheres to the Public Library Trustees Ethics Statement developed by, the, by United for Libraries, a division of ALA. The Code of Ethics of ALA is part of our supplemental appendices in our policy, and just this past year, the library adopted the Public Library Trustees Ethics Statement from United for Libraries. So check. Core seven, the Board of Trustees adopts written bylaws that outline the Board's purpose and operational procedures and, ad and address conflict of issues, uh, con conflict of interest issues. Um, we have just reviewed our bylaws in the past year and we are in compliance. Core eight, the Board of Trustees appoints a qualified librarian as library administrator and delegates active management of the library to the library administrator. Good evening, it's nice to be here. <laughs> Core nine, the Board of Trustees meets regularly in accordance with the Illinois Compiled Statutes and with the library administrator in attendance. All board meetings and board committee meetings shall comply with the Open Meetings Act. And here we are. Core 10, the Board of Trustees has exclusive control of the, of the expenditure of all monies collected, donated, or appropriated for the library fund and all property owned by the library. Core 11, the library has a board approved written budget the budget is developed annually by the library administrator and the board with input from staff. We'll begin that process again this spring. The board of trustees annually determines if the library's revenues are sufficient to meet the needs of the community. If the revenues are not sufficient, the board of trustees will take action to increase the library's revenues. I would say that this largely relates to our annual levy adoption process in the fall. Um, the operative word here being sufficient and how we would how we would determine what sufficiency means. So that would be something for us to kind of consider as we, as we go forward. Um, I'll touch more on that in a moment. The library has a board approved mission statement, a long range strategic plan, disaster prevention and recovery plan, collection management policy, personnel policy, technology plan, and other policies as appropriate to the library's operation and regularly updates and maintains them as appropriate. And we are in compliance. Page three, core 14, the library, administers, uh, the library administrator presents written monthly reports, including statistics on library operations to the board of trustees. In addition, monthly fiscal reports are presented to the library administrator and or library board treasurer. All present here in your packet. Core 15, the board of trustees annually reviews the performance of the library administrator. We'll do that here soon. Mm -hmm. The library is a member of the Illinois Regional Library System, RAILS, fulfills the membership requirements of its system, and is, res and is a responsible partner in the Illinois Library and Information Network, also known as Illinet, and participates in resource sharing through interlibrary loan and reciprocal borrowing. And how? Core 17. The library provides access to resource sharing databases, participates in resource sharing by entering the library's collections into a regional, statewide, or national database, that's our OCLC database, and actively promotes resource sharing via interlibrary loan and reciprocal borrowing. Core 18, the library utilizes a variety of methods to communicate with its community. We do, and we're continuing to grow those methods. Core 19, the library is located in a facility designed or renovated for library purposes and complies with all applicable local, state, and federal codes. We do. Core 20, a library is open a minimum of 15 hours per week according to the Illinois Administrative Code. I think we exceed 15. Mm -hmm. Core 21, as a baseline, the library appropriates money to major budget categories, personnel benefits, library materials, and other operating expenditures using the Illinois Public Library Annual Report statewide percentages analysis. And we do. Core 22, the library board and staff promote the collections and services available to its community. And core 23, at least every five years and more and more frequently if necessary, the library conducts a review to determine if the library is providing facilities, collections, and services in a quantity at a time and in a matter that meets the needs of the community. So we have conducted a community survey 
and that would be a method by which we would collect this information. And in reference to um, core 12, where I mentioned sufficient earlier, I would imagine that the outcomes and outputs that are measured through our community survey would help to inform sufficiency and guide um, our strategic initiatives from there. Um, so I believe that it is, it is time for us to, again, conduct another survey. We've done that as part of our past uh, strategic planning process, and as we're about to enter our final year of our strategic plan, uh, now would be a good time for us to revisit another community survey uh, process. So those are, are the core 23 standards that have been identified here. Do you have any questions about any of those core standards? But regarding the strategic planning process, that's a, I think that's a whole discussion. And I think what we had talked about earlier was doing some brainstorming sessions with staff from the different departments to yes. sort of see in terms of where we see it before going out to the public and then letting the public massage or give other input because I think it's easier to react to ideas mm -hmm. or preferences. And I think one of the things that Winneka did pretty well when they were doing it is they would just shoot out not big surveys, they would do different topics, and I think they prob probably leads to an easier, a bigger, a, a higher response rate. Mm -hmm. Like, say, for instance, one of the things in your long-term plans is, uh, not long-term plans, but in the strategic plan, is more comfortable spaces. It might be, you know, having them, you know, having examples of what that more comfortable space looks like, mm -hmm. and letting them vote on it. Mm -hmm. You know, after you've done the youth study, but that's, I think sometimes it's easier to do smaller snippets if you've got a database than it is to do one big thing in terms of massaging it and then being more progressive with that. So that's in response to mm -hmm. that survey. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments about the items in the core standards? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the next chapter relates to governance and administration. And we have spent a fair bit of time this past year um, going over governance and administration as we reviewed and did a comprehensive um, overview of our bylaws and reviewed our administrative policies um, and re re recently reapproved all of those. Um, I think for this one, the, um, the checklist is a pretty good summary of this chapter. So I'd like to go through that checklist with you, and that is on page seven. So the governance and administration checklist reads like this. The library has an elected or appointed board of trustees. Yes. The library has a qualified library administrator. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The library administrator files the Illinois Library Annual Report, IPLAR, with the Illinois State Library. Yes, we do that with the board. The library administrator prepares monthly reports, including statistics of operations and services for the board's review. The library administrator and or library board treasurer prepares monthly fiscal reports for the board's review. The library has a mission statement and a long-range slash strategic plan. Yes. The library maintains an understanding of the community by surveys, hearings, and other means, and we are circulating patron comments as another mechanism that we do to collect data. Mm -hmm. The library board reviews library policies on a regular basis. We have a policy committee for that purpose. The library board members participate in local, state, regional, and national decision making that will benefit libraries. Our board is increasingly involved as stakeholders in community decisions. Um, and, and represent the library well in terms of advocacy. We also have an advocacy committee. Mm -hmm. The library develops an orientation program for new board members. The library board members attend local, regional, state, and national conferences pertinent to libraries when fiscally possible. It seems appropriate for me to mention that the annual ALA conference is in Chicago this summer, and I would encourage you all to attend. And United for Libraries generally the first day or the day before will have a whole trustee, but they've not published it, the, the date or what the topics are. And I know one, you had sent me Cynthia, they're looking for presenters, but that tends to be pretty good. And, and, and then you can go to the ALA. Mm -hmm. There's a whole track dedicated just to trustees. And that's a one day thing. Uh, the library keeps adequate records of library operations and follows proper procedures for disposal of records. Yes. 
The library compiles and keeps current with appropriate Illinois and federal laws pertaining to public libraries? Yes. The library has a board approved set of written bylaws that govern and conduct the board of trustees and its relationship to the library and staff. The library maintains insurance covering property and liability, including volunteer liability? Yes. And the library has a written succession plan focused on both internal and external talent development to fill anticipated needs for library leadership and other key personnel. And I would say that yes, we do, and that's one of those things that we can continue to grow and develop upon. Um, there was yeah. documentation for me when I came in as a new director, um, and with additional roles. Um, right now, we're having some turnover in management positions. Um, this week, our new finance manager, John Risco, began yesterday, and um, our outgoing business manager had a lot of documentation prepared to help um, orient him to his role. So I think in that terms, we have good cross-training and succession planning. Um, and the same is also true of our adult services manager vacancy that's, about, uh, that's upon us right now as well. So based on what we've got here, I feel that we satisfy every item on the governance and administration checklist. However, I take any questions or comments that you may have that may look for clarification or anything else related to that. I have no other questions. You? Okay. Well, I really appreciate you um, allowing us to go through this process together. I think it's important, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited to see that the legacy of this library continuing to meet and exceed those standards continues. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is the director's report, and you will find the director's report behind tab six. Um, we begin, as always, in my report with some strategic plan progress updates. Um, the first item I want to mention is objective one three, um, and that is the public forums. Um, immediately preceding this meeting this evening, I attended the PACE public hearing um, regarding their bus service in our community. Um, I did make a presentation in, as, in part of the public comment portion of that meeting, and I stayed for a good portion of the meeting to hear what the concerns were of our community. Um, as you may know, and as it is listed here in, in my report, um, Route 421 is scheduled to be discontinued. Route 421 is the only PACE bus route that comes to Wilmette Public Library. There is a bus um, uh, shelter that is right on Wilmette Avenue um, that happened to coincide with our outdoor renovation project last year and we had to reroute a little bit of our planning as a result of that. Um, the, that is for, west, um, for westbound traffic. Eastbound traffic um, drops off right at the front door of the library. Um, so this, this library is well served by PACE currently. With the proposed changes, um, Route 422 would be redeveloped, would absorb some of the routes within the 421 plan currently, but would not stop at Wilmette Library regularly. Um, I learned this evening that um, some of the westbound routes would still run, and those are the ones that would technically be serving uh, Loyola and New Trier West students. Uh, those are the highest use um, bus routes currently running. So those would be the, the high traffic um, early morning and mid-afternoon routes. As a few of the residents in our community stated, the west side of Wilmette will no longer be represented by Pace Bus Service. Now, as a public library, I spoke um, with concern towards public libraries in general. Public libraries are one of the great equalizers in our culture. Um, we provide equitable and appropriate access. And I think access is the really important word here. I am concerned that with this proposal, our patrons will not have immediate access to the library. The bus will be stopping um, at Green Bay, which is only about a block away. But I see a lot of the clientele that come into our library on a daily basis that rely on PACE service, and it gives me concern. Um, PACE did involve a number of stakeholders in their planning, and before they even got to the stage where they were having public hearings, um, I did express concern that um, public libraries were not stakeholders in those conversations. I also understand that with proposed um, residential developments that are going up in our neighborhood, that there are also opportunities for subsidies to improve um, affordable housing within our community, which we know is a need. I don't know how much PACE was involved um, with the village in discussing what those plans might be going forward, but it concerns me knowing that some of the plans to redevelop a portion of our downtown area 
um, may also provide funding for affordable housing elsewhere further west in the community however there would not be you know um, uh, pace bus service that would be directly available to those folks another point that i wanted to share too that i'm acutely aware of and and i think pace identifies this in their own vision they've got a vision 2020 plan <laughs> where they talk about um, the how our suburbs were basically developed um, for automobile traffic and not so much for um, mass transit mm -hmm. The Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning has a vision for 2040, 2050, and on out into the future. And in collecting their statistics, they're recognizing that generations that are coming up today do not find it a luxury to own a vehicle, they find it a luxury to not own a vehicle. I believe as part of our, our community's concerns for sustainability and having more interest in the environment that there should be more planning to improve um, public transit infrastructure and to involve key infrastructure in the community that is of immediate impact, such as a public library, such as schools, and other valuable resources. Um, I encourage PACE to continue to reach out to the library and other government entities when they're making plans like this going forward. While they say it is not a foregone conclusion that these changes will take place in August, I really do feel that this is probably what the future of this is going to look like and we're not going to have service. That service will affect some of my staff. Um, a number of our staff commute from the city, they come up to Linden and they take the 421 over. Uh, the options now will be reduced. Um, there are not as many services that are going to be running here. So um, for some of my staff, they've already started making alternative arrangements and they take a bus up from the Howard Red Line station, which is a significant longer commute for them. Um, so anyway, I know I'm, I'm kind of rambling on this subject a little bit here, but it's a topic that's near and dear to me. And I think, you know, public access is a really key element when we're talking about services at the library. So I did participate in public comment tonight. Um, and I'm, Anthony, yeah. me. was it, let me mind a question. Did PACE identify that ridership has decreased? I mean, is that why, it's, maybe that's, that's sort of right. obvious. That's obvi right, obviously, you know, I think they're looking for cost savings measures. Um, and they're trying to find ways to consolidate routes. I think they made a really, a really great point in presentation about what their plans are. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of the routes that are discontinued, um, including one that um, serves the Lincolnwood area, completely eliminates access to that library. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I didn't even know that before looking at that presentation tonight. So I, I kind of feel that, you know, we all need to be talking with one another and recognize who the key, who the key stakeholders and communities are. And, you know, it's my concern that libraries just are not always at the table um, and we serve everyone. So that was kind of the point of, of me being there to represent that. But yes, I do think that low ridership is part of that. And I make a point because my office is right outside of where the, the shelter is. I, if, if I'm there and I see the bus go by, I take a peek in. And it is true. Um, it, it isn't nearly as trafficked. But by representation, there were a number of people in the room who rely on that, that that is their only form of transportation. Hmm. Have they ever thought of running smaller buses instead of the great big ones where they are required to handle, you know, 30, 40 people or something to make it a success. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. I used to take the 421. The only time that you see it crowded is doing when school. they're picking up the kids yeah. from yeah, school. Right. <clears throat> and it doesn't, it's not reliable if you're coming back late. If you miss that bus, good luck. Oh. You know, when you come back on the right. L, if you're using mm -hmm. it to connect to the Metro or the L. And that was a long time ago. Wow. And it doesn't run regularly on the weekends, if at all. Mm -hmm. And the library is open both days. So sure. again, the, and that affects the staff, it affects the public. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, the point behind all of this is the library hosts public forums for residents to explore and discuss community-wide issues or topics. And I applauded PACE for holding five of their six hearings in public libraries in the region, which mm -hmm. is good, because um, they know this is a place where people can, can meet. Interesting, because that's where they're cutting off their, yeah. <laughs> their access. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so that's, mm -hmm. that's that belabored point. Um, Moving on, um, okay. the library continues to partner with the Complete Count Committee regarding Census 2020 with the Village of Wilmette and the League, thank you. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, 
I also noted that um, some of our most uh, well-attended programs recently uh, for adults have been presented in partnership with other community organizations. That would include uh, the Wilmette Kenilworth Chamber of Commerce. Uh, there was a reference to our SCORE meeting um, that drew over 70 participants in January. Um, Go Green as well as the North Suburban Genealogical Society. And those partnerships um, strengthen our commitment to community members' aspirations, and um, we continue to want to um, see that community participation. So we're happy to continue to see that trend. Just a slight uh, addition that Go Green will met, you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> also, with your census, you had the regional director from the U.S. Census that did the presentation. Um, at Jan, at Jan Schakowsky's yeah. mm -hmm. meeting, yes. Yeah, yeah so you had that was a well-attended event in early February. Um, I wanted to make note, too, um, as we mentioned earlier, that um, we are continuing to study space, particularly that on the mezzanine. Um, if you have been to the mezzanine in the past couple weeks, you'll see that we have relocated the reference collection to the uh, north side of the mezzanine, that the south side stacks have been uh, completely emptied. Um, this is part of our phase uh, where we're going to soon be um, disassembling those, those shelves, um, putting them in storage. We're going to hang on to that stuff. Um, and um, we're going to experiment by putting some additional tables and chairs up there so that we can expand our study space on the mezzanine and see how that, uh, how that works for the community in response to the demand. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just during um, the times when uh, students are studying finals um, pretty much every day. Uh, uh, all, the so all the seating in, in the first floor and mezzanine area is occupied, uh, particularly after school. So um, we would like to try to uh, experiment a little bit in advance of a, of a space needs assessment and a community study to see if, um, if we can meet the needs of the community um, by opening up the mezzanine a little bit. Um, under Objective 3-4, uh, develop a comprehensive plan to integrate diversity into library programming services and staff. Uh, last year, Adult Services Librarian Rachel Garcia participated in, in Reaching Forward, and she learned about the learning circles there. And as a result of that, she is going to be launching an ASL, American Sign Language program here at the library as part of a learning circle. Um, so that series is going to be running on Tuesdays in February. Um, we launched our Conversation Cafe, which is for English language learners, ELL. Um, uh, that conversation cafe kicked off in January, and um, we're going to continue to study um, the usage there and um, try to encourage further participation. How many that. people showed up? I don't have direct statistics on okay. that one at the moment. I'll get back to you. That could be so valuable <coughs> if people could make it or would make it to something. You know, like it's that. still a yeah. new series, so we're mm -hmm. trying to continue to do outreach sure. and make sure that we're reaching everyone that needs to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also wanted to mention, and Stephen was, uh, was maybe a little coy about this, um, Stephen um, in his presentation earlier today mentioned that he's on a number of committees. He's in fact the chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, mm -hmm. and I think he's doing a fantastic job in helping to develop our diversity statement and our plan for services um, to incorporate um, additional equity, diversion, diversity, and inclusion initiatives for both the staff and the public. Um, so a lot of activity taking place um, behind the scenes um, right now at the library. Um, what else can I share with you here? I would like to, to give a brief update about our One Book Everybody Reads program. So this, um, this past fall, we had an opportunity to select one of the most hotly anticipated books of the year for our one book program. And we were really thrilled to present that, that book to the community. Right upon its release, we realized how problematic decisions like that can be. With the selection of American Dirt by Janine Cummins, we recognized um, that while a book can debut at number one on the New York Times bestseller list and earn the accolades of being selected as Oprah's book club selection, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to be a universally accepted title and not without challenges. The challenges that we learned about from this title were largely in the form of criticism from the Latinx community and concerned issues about representation and equity in the publishing industry, particularly about how this book was merchandised and marketed to uh, the buying public, and particularly to libraries. That was why it was so hotly anticipated. 
Um, while it is a work of fiction, the subject matter of the title is incredibly valuable and timely and complex. And I think the, everything that constellates the publication of the specific title um, bears reflection and discussion. When staff learned about these challenges, um, and when we learned that the publisher, as a result of some of the challenges associated with this rollout, decided to cancel the author's book tour, the staff decided we needed to retool our one book program for the spring and we couldn't run it as we normally would. Now we've published an article about this in the paper. Uh, the Beacon in fact run, ran two pieces in the same issue, including an editorial um, from the editor about our selection. Um, it was a tough choice uh, to make this determination. Um, that said, when you receive your um, off-the-shelf newsletter um, here in the next week or so, you will see that we, will, we are continuing to hold some book discussions about American Dirt here at the library. And we will be offering a couple programs um, that were part of our original plan series where we're going to be hosting um, three individuals who have experienced a relocation as part of immigration to the United States, mm -hmm. and they'll be telling their firsthand account about their experience, as well as we'll be reviewing um, with a Northwestern um, professor um, some literature about um, Im the immigration experience uh, that will add additional context to this conversation. The library does feel that um, American Dirt um, is still worth discussing on a number of levels. And because of that, we're going to be holding discussions here at the library. Our Classics and Contemporary Book Discussion Group is still going to be discussing this title, and we will be holding two, two book discussions as well moderated by adult services librarians. Um, we feel that if ever there were a place in the community to talk about a book, it would be the public library. And since this is one of our most popular titles in circulation right now with over 100 copies out there, we do feel we need to provide this space for it. Um, that doesn't mean that we endorse all the content of the material or that we disagree with um, the exceptions that have been made by a number of individuals who express concern about this uh, specific title. Um, we just feel that it, we are uh, a site to have this conversation. We want to continue to do that. Do you all have any questions or comments about the library's determination regarding our one book programming this spring? No, I'm glad that you are pursuing as much as possible <clears throat> for people to partake because I think it's uh, really important to discuss why it happened to this book and <clears throat> who controls what and uh, take from the book the lessons that can be learned in spite of the fact that people don't want it circulating because of one reason or another. And I think it's, it's good for our residents to see what happened and why and determine whether they feel that it was a good thing that it happened or not. Uh, at, but at least get a lot, there's a lot that can be learned from that book. And that's what we're about as libraries, so I think it's great. It's fiction, and it gives, it's palatable mm -hmm. in some parts, but I think it gives an idea of the voyage of some and yeah. how hard mm -hmm. it is and what made them leave. And so I think mm -hmm. it's right for, it makes you want to find out more. And so that serves the library's role to be a resource, you know, in terms of finding out mm -hmm. what are some of the things that are going in terms of current events. As well as you've got other topics that are coming up with it as to who has the agency to tell the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in terms of how it's handled, I think those discussions might also help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you probably got more people reading it since the controversy. Right. Yes. Well, and I think anecdotally that is something that the staff have, have noted as well. Um, I, I think we pay attention to the publishing industry and this type of information much more closely than maybe the average consumer does. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, I think we've been very close to this conversation. A lot of folks may be just hearing about it right now. Um, and so their, their interest is particularly piqued. Um, I do think it's important that I also mention that we do have um, a page up on our website right now that kind of summarizes everything that I just said, maybe a bit more articulately, and um, also provides references to additional titles that relate to the same topic uh, that are written in own voices and from those who have lived this experience to add additional credibility to that discussion. 
Um, so while this is one title on a subject, there are many others um, that can add to that understanding. How will this book impact how you choose one book will met in the future? I think, you know, going forward, um, this certainly this certainly does bring to light the, the concern about own voices. Um, that was a big piece of this. I yeah. think it also <laughs> brings to light um, you know, we had we had an advanced reading copy of this title when we did the, our selection. Um, maybe, maybe choosing a title that um, hasn't been published yet is a gamble. You know, you don't necessarily know what the reception is going to be, or or if it is even going to go forward. Um, so there there are a number of ways that we can look at at our approach to to the selection process going forward. Um, I do think it, it, we have spent an awful lot of time in discussion about this process and we will certainly be transformed by this experience going forward. I think ultimately, um, uh, as whatever, I mean, certainly the, the, sta the effort the staff had to go through to get to launch this book and the speaker, uh, certainly that's disappointing that that, that energy kind of goes to waste. On the other hand, just like someone did before, we at, at the library, we're all about being a learning resource. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about um, identifying going forward books that come from that are, so, that are written by the sources of the experience, but also about how we as a culture can, are, you know, how we, how we look at things, how we judge something. And so I, I've read all kinds of articles that are pro and con for this book, and I think the pros and the con perspectives all make sense, and so the fact that the library will be discussing, I believe, that as well is all going to be very enriching for our community just in terms of enlightening us to, to not rush to judgment um, necessarily on, on one side or the other, but understand that there is that there are pros and cons and values to to what to what we're uh, this is all about, and that we're a place to help have that conversation yes, exactly. and yeah. to ha and to have a civil constructive conversation in our community. That that's part of our role. One of the things that was interesting because at the legislative breakfast, I the, I talked to the Evanston librarian, and she says what they do is basically they take recommendations from the readers and let the hmm. Patrons vote on what mm. the one oh, really? is. That's I mean that's how they came up with James Baldwin. Oh. Uh -huh. so. Well, that might be something to do yeah. once or oh. try it. Try out. it not necessarily for one book, but try it for another thing. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of patient patrons' choice. This isn't probably directly related, but <clears throat> there's a absolutely wonderful, wonderful series of programs. Uh, I can't remember which channel now. Andrew Zimmer, Zimmer the chef, and he is done a series of very well run, very well put together programs on immigrants who come in to help in the food industry. And it's quite eye opening. And as I said, very well done. It's something that might be interesting for people to, to know about. Okay. Um, I think everything else in my report is just going to pale into um, <laughs> petty details after these heavy topics that we've discussed here. Um, so I, I think at this point I'd, I'd kind of like to turn towards the colorful pages of my report on page 8 and 9. Um, on page 8 you'll see a, a few of our top performing ah. social media posts. Um, one of those related to Wilmette Public Library earning a Library Journal five-star status. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> uh, that'll be it. Um, and um, we also see one of our trustees represented there on our, on our Instagram. Um, Trustee Wolf was at the Great Wall of China, and he brought his Wilmette Library card there. So we really do travel all over the world. Did they honor it? <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe part of the wall was built by books. You, know? <laughs> well, you went down that slide. It's Wagen, yeah. The yeah. Yeah. did they? Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize our staff as two of our employees um, are authors and or illustrators. And I've, I've drawn reference to them um, in our special staff news portion. Um, our Youth Services Assistant Manager, Lisa Bigelow, um, her 2018 novel, Drumroll Please, has been honored with a place on the Rebecca Caudle Young Readers Book Award list. Mm -hmm. um, this is the list. It, it hasn't been selected just yet, um, but that's an amazing accolade, and we are thrilled. Mm -hmm. um, students come in all the time for Caudle uh, books, and it would be amazing if, in fact, one of our staff members' books was, in fact, one of those it call winners. So um, we're thrilled to have her recognized there. Um, and I we're all can just P.S. <clears throat> that I read that book quite a while ago, and it's very, very well done. Good story, good lessons. <laughs> 
um, and she's she's got other titles as well. Mm -hmm. So definitely check out Lisa's work. Um, and we also have another storied um, author illustrator on our staff shelf, where Miriam Nurlove has been writing books for decades, mm -hmm. and I wasn't aware until I just started digging a little bit more. Some of these books were part of my childhood, and I'm thrilled wow. to know that Miriam is here on our staff, and her illustrations are absolutely charming. Um, she does so much with um, painting animals, mm -hmm. and um, we have many of her books in circulation here at the library, so I would encourage you to, to take a look at some of her work. But she was featured in the New York Times Book Review for an illustration in her book, um, I Am Polar Bear. So we <laughs> wanted to call out reference to that. Um, other staff meetings I would mention, um, this uh, next week is PLA in Nashville, and I will be physically attending the conference, so I'll be out of the office for that. I'm um, excited to share my feedback from that conference when I get back. Um, while I'm away, we're also going to be having our first virtual PLA conference um, in, the, uh, in the boardroom. We're going to be simulcasting um, the conference for the staff who cannot physically attend. So they'll have an opportunity to show up for um, select uh, events on the three days that the conference is running. Um, so we're excited to offer that as an opportunity so that folks don't have to be out of the building for the whole week. Um, do you all have any other questions yeah, I about noticed, my report? Yeah, I noticed that if I look at youth services, there's been a huge jump in the number of people that were serviced in January. What caused that? And that you've got a few more programs, but if you're going from 2000, 1,288 to 2,139, that's a quite substantial jump. I'm just In curious. terms of program attendance. Yeah, you, you had it slightly higher, but, but, mm -hmm. but if you look yeah. at it, it's still huge. So I'm just curious what's going on there. Well, I think that would probably have to do with some of our, our programs that we had this past month. So that would include the Wiggle Worms events, which were a big draw, yeah. okay. um, as, um, as well as Wendy and DB visiting the library. Um, we're also offering more open play events. Um, if you saw um, Instagram yesterday, we had a, a time lapse of the um, Imagination Playground um, event, which is really kind of fascinating to see the way the kids are putting together those uh, those blocks. Mm -hmm. So that, um, I think, would account for the additional programming and, and attendance. Okay, thank you. And just as a, a small detail, it's nice to know that um, the electronic items that were in storage that we don't need were given to a responsible recycler. recycler. Mm -hmm. A detail that jumped out at me from the circulation statistics. Books, physical walk-out-the-door books, accounted for about half the collection and approximately half of the circulation, mm -hmm. which is a footnote to the presentation that opened our meeting tonight mm -hmm. that a great deal more activity is going on with non-physical books than I think most people would even imagine is true. We're circulating a lot of materials that 25 years ago were not imagined to be a part of our collection, let alone a primary part of our circulation. I, I love hearing that because that is the perfect <laughs> argument for anyone that says libraries, why do we need libraries today? Right. Absolutely. Um, we're, we are more than books too. Mm -hmm. and even in terms of our circulation, our programming statistics are certainly up, but with circulation it is true. Um, there's so much more to to it than the books. Um, even as we do see physical media declining ever so slightly in circulation, CDs and DVDs, I think there's a long tail on those right now. Um, but uh, digital, as Stephen indicated, has doubled. Um, we continue to see exponential growth in that, and we will continue to see that. Mm -hmm. So, great observation. Yeah, the Chicago Tribune had a nice the, the book. Uh, John Warner, I think, is the book. The writer in the Chicago Tribune had written about the importance of libraries in, in the context of the issue of the government possibly taking away the funding. But I thought that was a great, great piece about everything we're talking about. Was that the one on Sunday? I believe it was Sunday. Where they talked about the most visited place. I think that's what it was, yeah. 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 In terms of movies, more so than movies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In terms more, of more the people average attend, attendance. Exactly, more people attend from the, the library. study. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. okay. Well, that, that concludes my report. Okay. Dan, do you have any updates for us from ILA? Uh, not really. The, uh, yeah, yeah. Not that I'm in here. All right. Not the trustee forum workshops. Um, on Saturday, March 7th in Springfield, I think you mentioned those, that one, and uh, the Illinois State Library, 9 to 2 30 or something. Then there's a trustee forum workshop in Chicago on the 14th of March. And then the big Reaching Forward conference is Friday, May 1st at the Donald E. Stevens Convention Center in Rosemont. So and John, you're going, are you going to the March 14th workshop at Oak? I am not. I decided to wait. Um, Oak Brook is okay. not as, as accessible as waiting for the um, meetings downtown at McCormick Place. Mm -hmm. But I do have those on my calendar. I'm looking forward to that. Great. Okay. And when they, a lot of times it's real late notice. That's why it, is exactly when the date is. Sometimes you'll get it two weeks before and they pull it together for that at the A ALA. Work. Thank you. Do you and want to tell me about other thing that I'll just throw out there is that the world's first mobile library of things is on the way in the UK. They're, they're setting up a, a truck so that they can go around and mm -hmm. deliver to people and pick up things. So that may be coming. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we went to the President's Day Library Legislative Breakfast on Monday, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. the first time that it wasn't snowing <laughs> in probably about five years. <laughs> And uh, they were talking pretty much, well, they were focusing more on overall library mandates, but the thing that most, that impacts us the most would be probably the 2020 census. Mm -hmm. I think equitable uh, and protect net neutrality yep. would be two of yep. the major ones, as well as preserve library funding sources in light of what's proposed with the budget, both the libraries and museums. And so the federal budget, the proposed budget for 21 is to eliminate the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And this has been a part of this administration's budget for the last few years. Um, and to date, it has not. That doesn't mean that that's not, not going to be the case. Um, there, there was an increase in funding this past year, and we hope that that continues. LSTA funding. Um, is tied to the Institute for, for Museum and Library Services, and that funds a lot of Live and Learn grants. It funds construction grants. It funds technology access in public libraries um, and definitely applies to the much less well-funded libraries than our own. Mm -hmm. uh, so preserving that little bit of federal funding that some libraries get can, can make a world of difference in those communities. And LSTA was 195, $195 million in Illinois last year, but the peak was in 2010 when they got $213 million. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was sort of interesting is that they are pushing for no unfunded mandates in Springfield. So oh. that... Mm -hmm. You know, basically they're requiring things, but if they're not funding them, no dice. Well, wow. you know, most public libraries in Illinois are are funded 95 percent or better by local property taxes, mm -hmm. and any attempts to freeze property taxes would have a direct adverse effect on public libraries. Mm -hmm. Um, and other measures that might relate to a reduction in property taxes, um, you know, is what uh, the ILA is standing to oppose. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I would I would add that I felt that the um, the representation that was present at the Buffalo Grove Legislative Breakfast was strongly in favor of, of libraries and the services that we provide. I feel like our representatives understand what we do. Um, um, a number of them commented on how responsible we are in our governance and how transparent we are in terms of our, our leadership there and how responsible we are in terms of our spending, um, that we uh, only budget for what we're going to spend and that we deliver uh, a high return on the investments that are made in our services. So. Um, I felt strong support from, from our legislators, uh, particularly um, those who directly serve our community. 
Anything else you want to add about that? No, that the reason for the push behind the census is because Illinois has the highest per capita grant, even though California got the most money hmm. 10 years ago. So that's why the big push is because they're okay. fear of losing out. So we applaud the library for helping with the complete census count. Okay. Anything for National Library Legislative Day? Um, I, I'm not aware of our participation here at Wilmette Library in the past on National Library Legislative Day. Um, that takes place uh, May 4th through 5th um, in Washington, D.C. Um, I don't know if we've ever sent any delegation I'm, there. I've been one time. You've okay. been. Have I've been time. about 15 times. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Okay. But not recently because in the old format, it involved considerable walking mm. because it involved to visits walk. to congressional offices, mm -hmm. um, and that's no longer something that my physicians would recommend. Um, if the new format is less focused on direct office visits, then I would consider taking a look at it. Um, Illinois was for at least 20 years the largest delegation to that event and we had representation there almost every one of those years. Um, I don't recall when we didn't. Uh, that extends sufficiently far that my son participated when he was in junior high, um, and drew special. I mean, he's a bright redhead. He drew special attention from both Sid Yates and from Senator Simon, and both were very impressed at how articulate he was about the library. Um, so we have a long record of participation. In recent years, there hasn't always been as much focus on that by ILA, um, partly because of travel restrictions mm -hmm. and partly because I'm not sure if the event has drawn as many people, period. But it is well worth doing if it's organized in such a way that participation is possible. I know at the ILA, they said you're better off visiting the center, you know, the representative said at their home office because they are busy while they're in session and you generally get more bang for your buck visiting them right around here. And I think we've done a wonderful job of inviting them into Wilma. Yeah. All the public libraries, they do use it a lot. So that was where. And that was one of our side conversations yes. at the legislative breakfast as well, that um, uh, one of the representatives wanted to coordinate more office hours here at the library. So I, I like that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dan, can you attest to that, Would, um, you know, knowing the legislators the way that you do? Is it more valuable for us to connect with them locally as opposed to going to Washington as part of uh, National Legislative Day? It's certainly cheaper to do it locally. but. Um, <laughs> more Is fun to do it in the capital. <laughs> in terms of effectiveness, which one do you get more of their that attention? That is a uh, treatise long answer, which is not uh, sufficient for this particular meeting. It all <laughs> depends on what you mean by effective, what your objectives are, and I'll stop there. Okay. Okie dokie. Please. Okay. <laughs> the library will be closing in 15 minutes. Please bring your materials to the circulation desk now for checkout. Thank you. Uh, new business? Do you have anything else you want to add? I have nothing else. Uh, Anthony, uh, you've got a copy of the letter from Optima. We met with the developer. Thank you, Joan, for putting them my way. Putting them my way. And you've got a summary, and I think this is a pretty good summary of what's happening with the building. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people thought for space, you can have space, you know, but there are only going to be 23 on-site public parking spaces with a two-hour limit. Yeah. And you've got 
two restaurants that will be opening there, so you'll have that. Plus, if you look at the residents, you've got 109 residential units. I'm sure that they're going to have people visiting them. So we welcome them if it gets passed as neighbors, and I think it will add to the vibrancy, but that's about all we have to say. <laughs> One of the challenges that we have seen in past development proposals, including the one across the alley from the library, is that there is almost always insufficient parking provided for, especially if they're planning any retail. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue that probably is going to get more attention. Um, it's, uh, it's a very high density proposal for that space. And that's the, question, the other question that's going to get more public attention from the news reports we've mm -hmm. seen so far. Um, I think the major concern is, though, insufficient parking if they're going to have restaurants in the facility, because you not only have to provide parking for the staff right. of those restaurants, mm -hmm. but also for patrons. And if there isn't sufficient parking, then there's no way for those businesses to succeed. Unless the Metro 421 bus stops in the front of the building. <laughs> <laughs> so much for that. <laughs> well, the average unit's going to rent for 5000 yeah. a month. And they're small, right? I mean, smallish. Uh, wait a minute. It was 1300 1300 yeah. square feet. That's a good size like for a rental feet. unit. Mm -hmm. But that's also premium pricing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They said in the program uh, that I attended, um, actually Liz and I attended, that um, one to three bedrooms. And so mm -hmm. that 5,000 is uh, uh, average okay. mm. across the mm. one to three. Okay. Do we know what the occupancy level is across the alley? They mentioned that. Um, Did they? It was. It was. It's pretty well, high. It was high. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, 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 I don't think yeah. it's 100 percent, but it's. It mm -hmm. was anywhere from 70 to 90. Mm -hmm. Wow. I recall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's mostly small units. There are only a handful of three-bedroom units, mm -hmm. and and not very many two-bedroom units. Mm -hmm. And then Jan and I both stopped by the village. Not president, but the village. Oh, yes. Managers. Managers. Yes. Retirement, Retirement ceremony at right. the mm -hmm. Wilmette. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Country. That was very well attended. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of people we hadn't seen in a long time coming back and congratulating everybody. It was very nice. And then the uh, actual ceremony and celebration was at the village board meeting that week with, to start off with the uh, League of Women Voters uh, commendation and, and then uh, the, the retirement of Mr. Frenzer was, and he brought his family and, you know, so there was, uh, not, there were a number of people there for him and congratulating him and congratulating Mike then on his new, new position, which I think he's pretty well suited for. Any other new business? What's the staff day going to be? Yeah. Um, staff day, we, um, we will be closed on Friday, March 20th for staff day. Um, we are in the final stages of selecting our programming, and I believe the committee is meeting on Thursday this week to put, put all that planning together. So um, we'll give you more information about the content of that day um, when all that is settled. Okay. But we're excited and we're gracious for the opportunity to have that day closed. Thank you all for, for letting us do that. Sure. I motion, I think we're ready to motion to adjourn the meeting. Yes. I motion to adjourn the meeting. A second. second. <laughs> okay. Wolf's, Trustee Wolf has moved and Trustee Barshies has seconded that we adjourn the meeting at 10, 8.50.